Well, what I'm going to be doing today is uh, talking about some of the work that's been done by others and also by myself. And because I'm going to be throwing a lot of names at you, I've prepared handouts there on the uh, chairs, which hopefully you'll be able to take away. Well, I work on the assumption that uh, social inequalities create health inequalities. Personally, I don't really see the need to do research that shows that people using food banks are at risk for greater health or that people get laid off or are at risk for better health. There's a, a voluminous literature out there. So I begin with the assumption that public policy is creating the social inequalities that so many of us are concerned about because eventually they lead to poor health. But I also recognize that public policy doesn't happen by accident. Uh, I don't think people in Norway and uh, Finland, the policymakers, are a lot smarter than our policymakers. They just have different values and ideas than we might have. And I also am going to focus on the Canadian scene, and uh, for the fellow from Boston, the United States scene, in that uh, we are liberal welfare states that are dominated by business and corporate interests. And the history of public policy making and current policy making is that in the long and the short of it, they're more concerned about keeping Tim Hortons happy than they are paying the workers decent wages. And uh, there's good data and good arguments that business and corporate power is increasing in Canada. And that ultimately, if we're serious about doing anything about reducing health inequalities, we have to change the way we think about and the state is operating in Canada. So first of all, uh, everybody I know that does population health research uh, seems to be dominated by what Tober will describe as pluralistic concepts of policy making. And that is that one more article in social science and medicine that demonstrates that poverty or inequality is bad for health is suddenly going to be taken and acted upon by policymakers. And uh, the greatest example of this is that Canada has been churning out this stuff for the last 30 years. So people from elsewhere, from Belgium or France, they think that Health Canada is a health promotion and population health powerhouse because they don't then follow through and look to see to what extent any of this stuff's been implemented. And, but in contrast to this pluralistic view, the social inequalities and political economy literatures points out that ultimately public policy is shaped by the distribution of power and influence. And that it is these differences in power and influence that shape the quality and distribution of the social determinants of health. So a little bit of a review, in 1990, Espen Anderson, a Danish, uh, political economist, outlined three distinct approaches. And they're not just how much you spend or how you treat women. Uh, it's the central feature of these societies is the extent to which the society is concerned with either maintaining or reducing social stratification, providing people with the opportunity to have a decent life, even if they cannot work, which is called decommodification, and the relative role of the state, the market, and the family in providing people with economic and social security. Now, there's, uh, there's a, a literature out there. Uh, some people have added a Latin welfare state, and uh, that would be Portugal, Spain, Italy, and uh, Greece. Uh, other people have said maybe the UK, uh, maybe actually the UK, but primarily New Zealand and Australia are kind of different. And of course, we now have former uh, members of the Soviet bloc. And people are kind of ex moving beyond the worlds of welfare state. However, it seems to me that whatever typology you're using, Canada is a liberal welfare state. And I'm going to be focusing on the distinctive aspects of the liberal welfare state. Now, the model produced by a Saint Arnaud at uh, U of T and uh, Bernard, who I understand uh, died in the last couple of years, have been really useful. And to me, this was a revelation in that what they did was they looked at the three worlds of welfare capitalism, and I'm going to focus on the liberal welfare state. And these fellows argue that the primary ideological inspiration is to have government not do anything. So in the case of the social democratic countries, the primary ideological inspiration is to reduce poverty, 
reduce inequality, reduce unemployment. Kind of sounds like we're making this up. But when you look at the history of public policy in Scandinavia, uh, it's the main ideological inspiration, and the central institution that's responsible for carrying this out is the state. In contrast, in the liberal political economy, the main ideological in, in, uh, inspiration is for government not to do anything. And now you can understand why it's such a fight to get pharmacare, to get daycare. And the only reason we have health care was because of Tommy Douglas. So when you begin to realize that maybe a lot of the people that are running things don't really believe that government has a role, you can begin to understand why it's so difficult to shape public policy. And of course, the primary institution in the liberal welfare state is the marketplace, and which has implications. So the key institutions of the marketplace as a result, we have governments providing less economic and social supports to the population. We sometimes think we are really good because we compare ourselves to the United States. But if you compare ourselves not only to Scandinavia, but to France and Germany and Belgium and Holland, we provide people with very, very little economic and social security, which for today we might call the social determinants of health. We provide virtually no universal benefits, and when we do provide them, they tend to be targeted uh, and stigmatize people. Related to all of this is a weak labor sector, and as a result, the quality and equity of the distribution of the social determinants of health falls well behind other wealthy developed nations. Uh, as one example, this is total public expenditures. And what you can see is the liberal countries are distinguished, New Zealand, Canada, Ireland, USA, and Australia, by collecting a lot less of the gross domestic product and redistributing it in the form of public spending. Now, of course, this is ideological, because somebody from the Fraser Institute is going to look at this and say, Canada is doing really badly. Why aren't we as low as the USA and Australia? So there's some people who are going to look at this and say, hey, this is great, the system's working. But generally, as I say to my students, generally, when the government collects taxes and redistributes it, it tends to help most of us. And you can see that it's not just the red countries or the Scandinavian countries that do this. Also, the conservative countries of continental Europe take this idea seriously. So how do we kind of get a handle on this? Well, from my perspective, it's a question of what is the relative balance between the business and the corporate sector as compared to the labor sector and civil society. And the argument is that this relative balance of power translates into public policy that shapes the social determinants of health. And I don't think there's any evidence that's a, that indicates that precarious work is good for your health. I don't think there's any evidence that suggests that having moms stressed out about where to put their kids and being unable to work is good for their health. And similarly, there's a vast literature out there, especially within Canada, that suggests that these social determinants of health are indeed important determinants of health, and generally the approach that we take in Canada falls well behind other countries. Even in something like health care that we think is, is wonderful, we only cover 70% of health care costs among the lowest of OECD countries. So we don't do drugs, we don't do a lot of rehab, uh, we don't do home care in some cases. So there's a literature out there that's uh, about emerging threats. Uh, Bryant and uh, colleagues put together an article about uh, lost opportunities for addressing the social determinants of health. It turns out that we're still doing fairly well in life expectancy. Sometimes we're eighth, sometimes we're twelve, but we used to be third. And I'll show you some data about infant mortality where our data is like, our results are really bad. Now, retrenchment is occurring everywhere as a result of free trade, lowering of trade barriers, and uh, this is also occurring in the case in Sweden. The difference is that when I wrote an article about this and published it in the Scandinavian Journal of Public Health, the press actually called me, we did an interview, and this article hit the newspaper, and there were uh, 800 retweets, 35,000 likes, and they were able to get every leader of every political party to comment on my article. I can tell you that doesn't happen in Canada. No one's interested in anything that I'm doing, except maybe you people. 
And even in the conservative welfare states, an article just came out that argues that in terms of workplace and social insurance, uh, Germany has been transforming from a conservative to a liberal welfare state. And not surprisingly, Germany has had the greatest increases in poverty and inequality of any of the OECD nations. Now, a brand new book just came out by Keith Banting and John Miles, uh, which is called The Fading of the of Redistribution Agenda in Canada. And it's nice to read something from somebody that's not in health at all and find that my impressions, our impressions, are actually accurate. They make the argument that we're doing really badly in addressing the, the important public policy needs of Canada. He says, and sometimes it's actually done, that the government decides it's going to do something bad, like get rid of the child care program and give people 100 bucks a month. They also argue that frequently we have policy drift. We don't even respond to the emerging challenges. So we got all these immigrants coming to Canada who can't find work, but we don't do anything. Of course, the rise of neoliberalism, the belief that all government is bad and business is good, a gradual weakening of organized labor, uh, the fact that the government is just cutting out funding left and right. I personally see myself as a victim of SHRP not funding health research anymore, and maybe some others of you as well. But we have the, the end of the census, the end of the National Council of Welfare, the end of the status of women, uh, really weakening of research advisory and think tanks. And an important thing, especially in the history of Canada, is the devolution and weakening of the central government. That historically, when the central government plays less of a role, public policy and the social determinants of health uh, suffer. So just one example, in 1980, Canada was ranked 10th of 30 OECD countries in infant mortality. Uh, many people believe infant mortality is the most sensitive measure of overall population health. By 2002, we were now ranked 23rd of 30. And by 2010, we're now ranked 27th of 34 countries in our infant mortality rate. Now, there's not a lot of debate about this. It's just ignored. Just ignored. Occasionally, somebody will come out and say, oh, it depends on how you measure it. Canada and Sweden. Uh, use a particular approach that if you breathe one breath, you're alive. I said, okay, Sweden using that criteria has a 2.5 per thousand rate. We have a 5.1. And this is not just Aboriginal people. This is Quebec, this is Montreal, this is Toronto. Uh, models, I've gotten heavily into models. This is a model that was in the Scandinavian Journal of Public Health. And the argument basically is, is that you have these emerging uh, uh, challenges, uh, changes in trade agreements, immigration, and what happens is, as a result of this, it shapes the kind of domestic policies that shape the social determinants of health. But importantly feeding into this is the extent to which there's support for social democratic and left political parties. When left political parties are in power, the quality and distribution of the social determinants of health is more equitable. And the extent to which Scandinavians are continuing to support the universalist Nordic welfare state. And so here's a model that helps to bring together public opinion, public policy, and the social determinants of health. So my understanding, when people come out and say, what's the problem, what do we need to do, I believe that uh, the history of Canada, and especially the last 10 to 20 years, policy development seems to be clearly dominated by interests of the corporate and business sector. Uh, actually, things were pretty good until free trade came along in Canada. But of course, the argument is that if we didn't have free trade, things would be even worse. I'm not so sure about it. Uh, we've had changes in tax structures. I explained to my students what capital gains is. In other words, I just sit around and make money from my investments, and those taxes are cut because the business sector says, oh, you can't uh, tax capital investments. So generally, the CCPA has pointed out taxes on the wealthy has declined, taxes on the poorest people have actually increased, and as a result, uh, the middle class doesn't really believe the government can do anything for them, at least in English Canada, and so people give their allegiance to the marketplace. They really begin to, do, to believe that what's good for General Motors is good for everybody, 
or in our case, what's good for uh, Tim Hortons and Canadian Tire. And as a result, as people begin to feel that they're not able to influence, there's a withdrawal from uh, political engagement. So this is a model that will be coming out in a couple of weeks where basically I argue that in Canada, if you want to understand what's going on, look at the balance between the three different sectors, look at the extent to which uh, Canadians have a specific support for political parties, and look at the extent to which there's public support for a state role in providing resources and security. Canadians believe in health care. In Quebec, they seem to believe in child care. But that's about it. Uh, another way to get a handle on it, uh, this is child poverty is the triangles. We could spend years arguing what causes child poverty. Bad parents, they don't read to their kids at night, da da da. But basically the countries that have the lowest poverty rates, the Scandinavian countries, are the countries where the union sector is stronger and as a result there's a lot of collective agreements. Interestingly on the continent, unions are weaker but because of the general approach to maintaining social solidarity, you see that most workers are covered by collective agreements. And in the liberal countries such as Canada, we have the worst of both worlds. We have weak unions and low collective agreement coverage and a lot of child poverty. So what, what does it all mean in terms of doing anything? Well, David Langeal argues we need to educate the public to what's going on. Uh, in my paper, I argue that evidence isn't enough even saying public policy isn't enough, but we have to point out who is benefiting from all of this. Poverty is profitable. Uh, also, it's pretty clear that instituting left power is good. That's why I always like uh, Duceppe, uh, even though he was, uh, Duceppe was Duceppe. He had a good understanding of power dynamics in this country. And the, da the data is pretty clear that the form of political power shapes the form of the extent to which we provide people with what they need. And another incredible thing that would change public policy on a dime is the issue of proportional representation. If there was proportional representation, you'd have constant minority governments, even Alberta now, and as a result, the evidence indicates it would uh, lead to a more uh, just and distributive welfare state. So, first of all, uh, in terms of what we need to do, uh, when Alexander was eight, and he's not eight anymore, and he's not a little guy, uh, if you're in a hole and you want to get out, the first thing you have to do is stop digging. And what we seem to be doing in Canada is creating public policy to make people suffer, whether it's unemployment, whether it's wages falling behind, whether it's weakening unions. We seem to be doing a lot of stuff wrong. But there is some hope. Uh, Ryan Maelli from Saskatchewan has started a new uh, public education. Uh, upstream, and uh, the idea here is to provide people with evidence but also tell stories to build a movement about the social determinants of health. Uh, I would argue that someone should make it clear that there are people that are benefiting from all of this. Uh, Robert Shinomis and Hudson, uh, Ian Hudson from the University of Winnipeg or the University of Manitoba, I get them confused, has argued that we have to be really clear and pointing out to people uh, what's, what's going on. Uh, reject unions and prosper. This is from the Fraser Institute. Well, somebody's gonna prosper, but it's not gonna be her. Not gonna be her. And there's an awful lot of evidence about job security, wages, and health. Uh, Brady argues that to reduce poverty, you have to take into account uh, the ideology of the country, the coalitions that exist, the uh, institution of left power, and the extent to which we're willing to help people out. And just as one example, in Ontario, we had a child poverty program brought in, but the Liberals brought it in only the day after they lost two by-elections, which had been run on issues of power and influence and wages. Uh, the federal New Democrats swear to me and Toba that they're going to talk about the social determinants of health. Uh, well, we hope so. But this is the first time a political party did this. And finally, in terms of the research that I'm interested in doing, is trying to get a handle on what the public understands about determinants of health, uh, what the public understands about how public policy is made, especially of youth who have no idea what public policy is, uh, looking at the forces that are shaping political parties' policy positions. For those of us from Ontario, what is Andrea Horvath thinking? 
nobody knows. Uh, research into how the health establishment, including conferences like this, think about and act upon the social determinants of health. And finally, trying to do research to shift people's understandings and actions. Uh, there's probably good reason. 60% of Canadians say they would have a problem if their paycheck was a week late, which is incredible if you think about it. 50% of Canadians would have difficulties. Uh, we also have different discourses, which I've handed out for you. Uh, we've been putting this stuff out. This has been downloaded 200,000 times, and we have a French version, which I should have put up there. And uh, as I always say, go out and buy my books, please. Thank you. <laughs>